New beginnings. What can we say? We're a unique faith family. We're very diverse. We're diverse ethnically, economically, educationally, politically, and in religious background. Now, sociologists will tell you that it's nearly impossible to keep such a diverse group together. And yet, together we are. We're held together by a common confession of faith. I have come to believe that Jesus is the Son of God and that he willingly died so that I might live a life devoted to God in love. I believe Jesus rose from the dead and that the very power that raised Jesus from the dead is available to empower all believers to fulfill God's purposes for their lives. I have come to recognize my need for the Father, for his love and for his forgiveness. I recognize my need for the healing and restoring power of the Holy Spirit and his loving correction and guidance in my life. I will, to the best of my understanding and to the best of my ability, follow Jesus all the days of my life until he receives me into his heavenly home. So here we are, a small church on the corner of Jefferson Boulevard and Redwood Avenue. But where did we come from? Our spiritual DNA can be traced back thousands of years. And we can find some interesting characters in our church family tree. It all started with a jarring declaration. Jesus said, I'm starting a whole new race of people, the church, and I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. And so began the church of Jesus Christ. Now we can take a big jump down through history to a man with a very dangerous idea. You see, humans are prone to take anything that is alive and vital and institutionalize it to the point of death. It's what we do because we like to control things. So by the 1500s, the church, now centralized in Rome, had become a center of power for all things about God and the Bible. That's when a man comes along and actually starts reading the Bible for himself and says, wait a minute, you've got a few things wrong. In fact, you've got about 95 things wrong. And he writes down his thesis of 95 errors and nails them to the door of the Wittenberg Church on October 31st, 1517. His name was Martin Luther. His dangerous idea was sola scriptura, meaning the Bible alone is the authority for faith and practice. What's dangerous about the idea is that it allows people to think for themselves. The problem is that people can read exactly the same Bible and come to very different conclusions, as they did. This led to one church split after another, until today there are more than 35,000 different denominations in the world. But I also believe that God had his hand in all of this as well, because the decentralization of power is a safeguard. Power corrupts, even in the church. So, which of the various strains of this fractured DNA is in our background? That question brings us to a man who was a pastor for 10 years and almost gave up on his faith because he despairingly concluded he wasn't even a Christian. His name, John Wesley. In 1736, this young Anglican pastor was on a ship sailing from England to the New World. The weather became violent and the ship was in serious trouble. Wesley, also chaplain of the vessel, was scared to death. But there was this group of German Moravian Christians who were on their way to preach to the American Indians, and throughout the entire storm they sang calmly. Wesley was baffled about their serenity and asked, How do you manage to stay so calm? To which they responded, Well, don't you have faith in Christ? Of course, Wesley said he did but later reflected that his faith couldn't hold a candle to theirs. In fact, Wesley was confused by the experience, and he entered a long period of soul-searching 
which resulted in one of the most consequential conversions in church history. His heart was radically captured by God, which he would call a heart of love. And what followed was one of the greatest revivals in England in the 1700s. Knowing what we do about power, this didn't make him terribly popular with the Church of England. Wesley had his opponents, one of them being George Whitfield. On the occasion of Whitfield's funeral, the love and grace that so characterized Wesley had a chance to shine. A lady timidly approached Wesley. My dear Mr. Wesley, may I ask you a question? Yes, of course, madam, by all means. My dear Mr. Wesley, I am very much afraid what your answer will be. Well, madam, let me hear your question and then we'll know my reply. At last, after a, a little hesitation, she did ask, Mr. Wesley, do you expect to see Mr. Whitfield in heaven? A lengthy pause followed, after which John Wesley replied with the greatest seriousness. No, madam. The inquirer at once exclaimed, Ah, I was afraid that's what you would say. To which John Wesley added, with intense earnestness, Do not misunderstand me, madam. George Whitfield was so bright a star in the firmament of God's glory and will stand so near the throne that one like me, who am less than the least, will never catch a glimpse of him. John Wesley was a man of generous spirit who lived by the mantra of Augustine, in essentials unity, in doubtful matters liberty, in all things charity. This is definitely in the DNA of New Beginnings. The churches that grew out of the Wesleyan revival were derogatorily called Methodists because Wesley was so organized in his approach to discipling people through small groups that the word Methods and Methodists stuck, and the Methodists immigrated to America, where they became the largest denomination here in the 1800s. Our next ancestor gives me pleasure to introduce because she just didn't fit the mold. Meet Phoebe Palmer. Having been raised a Methodist, Phoebe, too, wanted to have a marvelous conversion experience just like Wesley. She prayed and she sought, but no dramatic emotional moment came. She felt like a failure. That's when tragedy occurred. She had two children who both died within months of their birth. She concluded that God must be punishing her for her failure to arrive at the spiritual pinnacle. Later, she would have two more children one of which was killed when the cradle caught on fire from a gauze curtain too close to the candle. Though her anguish was overwhelming, instead of turning away from God in despair, she relinquished herself to God. Though the joyous emotional pinnacle was never experienced, she prayed, Lord, if you can use me just as I am, then I'm yours. And he did. She started prayer meetings in New York City, which sparked a revival with an estimated 25,000 Americans becoming disciples of Jesus. She was one of many women who were recognized as leaders in the Wesleyan movement, who from the beginning invited women as full participants at all levels of church leadership. That's in our DNA. But the name Nazarene hasn't yet entered into our DNA. That won't happen until 1907. Like all organizations, the Methodists too drifted toward becoming overly institutionalized, losing their vitality. Which brings us to the next relative who has a close encounter with the Holy Spirit. Phineas Brzee. After 10 years of being a circuit preacher, Brzee has a close encounter with the Holy Spirit that catapulted him out of the dull drums of religiosity and propelled him into being a passionate evangelist. He was urged to start a new church in Los Angeles, California, which he did, 
calling it the Church of the Nazarene in honor of Jesus, a lowly Nazarene. He wanted the church to be identified with the marginalized, the poor, and the toiling masses for whom Jesus lived and died. The Church of the Nazarene, Los Angeles, California, 1907. Here's a funny story about the naming of this first church. There was a large contingent who wanted to call the church the Pentecostal Church of the Nazarene. But Brzee didn't want this close association with the emotionalism that was often associated with Pentecostal churches. Besides, they didn't allow smoking, and Brzee smoked a pipe. So he made a deal with them. He said, if you take the name Pentecostal out of the church's name, I'll give up smoking. And they did, and he did. And so we got our name, Church of the Nazarene. Now, jump down about 46 years. The district superintendent of the Metro New York District of the Church of the Nazarene was visiting New Jersey and saw hundreds of new homes being built near one of the largest Ford dealerships around. And it was accessible to the New Jersey Turnpike and Route US 1 South. He was convinced that this up-and-coming area, Edison, New Jersey, needed a Nazarene church. And so, the first church of the Nazarene was founded in 1953, first on Lahare Street and later moved to Jefferson Boulevard. Our name was updated to New Beginnings in 2000 under the leadership of Pastor Tom Saunders. And here we are. I am the 17th pastor to lead New Beginnings. We belong to the Metro New York District. The Metro New York District is around 130 churches in a 50 mile radius of Times Square. We have a camp, Camp Taconic Retreat Center, and we have a school of ministry, the Palmer Institute. The Metro New York District is part of the Church of the Nazarene International. There are 3,000 churches worldwide in 160 countries. We have 58 colleges, universities, and seminaries worldwide, and eight schools of higher education. So here we are. This is where our DNA has brought us. And now it's our turn to move the story forward. Let's write a great next chapter together.